today we're going to start chapter two and we're going to go over a lot of review of some terminology that we use in algebra. Specifically, we're going to talk about functions and we're going to look at our domains, ranges, we're going to look at one-to-one -one functions, onto functions, and we're going to decide whether our relations are functions by using the vertical line test. So those are all different vocabulary words that are going to make us be more successful algebra students. So let's first remember what a function actually is. So a function is it relates each element of a set with exactly one element of another set. Now in algebra we call these two sets of numbers the domain which represents our x values and our range, which represents our y values. So in our domain and range, we have to represent or map our values. Now notice that all of our members of the domain are going to their own y value. That's what makes this relation an actual function. If any of these points in the domain would go to two or more different places, then it would con be considered not a function. Since they all map to a different y value, now notice they're mapping to the same, that's okay, but each one of the domain values are going to their own y value. All right, so what does that look like visually? So you're gonna see replacing now that y value. Normally you would see a function y equals x squared. You're going to see a new notation and this is the function notation, that f of x. We're going to talk more about that later in the lesson, but this is what's happening here. So if you think that this orange box here is some kind of function that is making something, what you have is you have an input what we do is we input the domain numbers into some function and our output becomes our range. So our domain, our x values, goes into some kind of mathematical expression or a mathematical function and it produces our y values or our range. So in this case our function is x squared so if I put in a 1 and I square it, it gives me a 1. If I put in a 2 and I square it, it gives me a 4. A 3 squared gives me a 9, and that's how my function works. So these numbers that I'm inputting become my domain, and my output becomes my range. Another function is still, we give it a different name down here. We give it a g of x is equal to x squared, but you can see that my input is very different this time. Not only am I putting those countable numbers in there, I'm putting some integers in with negative values. So if I put in a negative 3 and I square it, it outputs a 9. If I put a negative 2 and I square it, it outputs a 4. So you can see that my domain looks different, but my range is going to look somewhat similar except for that 0 because of the values that I am actually inputting. Okay, so that's how a function works. Now, we do have different types of functions. We have a one-to-one -one function, an onto function, or a function could actually be both. So let's talk about those real quick. So one-to-one -one function is that in your domain and in your range, you are mapping one to a value, two to its own value, three to its own value, but I had an extra value in that domain. That's considered a one-to-one -one function when they're all going somewhere different, but they don't all have to be used up. In an onto function, you can see here, my one is going to D, my two is going to B, but three and four are both going to the same place. Now that is a legal function, but that's a special function that's called an onto function. That means every value in the range is, does not have a unique domain because three and four are both sharing the output C. 
that's an onto function. Now, to be categorized as both onto and one-to-one -one function, you'll see that everything maps to its own unique value with nothing left over in the range. When that happens, it's a crossover between a one-to-one -one and an onto function, and we consider it both. All right, so those are three different types of functions. Now let's look at a couple examples of some relations. So when I put a set of ordered pairs together like I do, I have three sets of ordered pairs up here. These sets of ordered pairs are called relations. Now I'm going to analyze these relations and then we're going to decide if these are functions. So we're going to do it first of all by mapping and then we're going to do it by graphing and look to see how they look when they are an actual function on a graph. So what I'm going to do is map my domain to my range. So if I look at my first relation I have up here, my domain members, remember, are my input or my x values. So my domains is going to be negative 3, 0, and 2, with my range being 1, 2, and 4. Now if I do a quick map of that, so negative 3 maps to 1, 0 maps to 2, and 2 maps to 4. So you can see that idea that they're all unique mapping to their own value. So for that reason, this is a function and we would classify this as both 1 to 1 and on 2 because I used all values in a unique way and nothing was left over. Now when I graph this relationship, let's look at see what we have. Negative 3, 1 goes here, 0, 2, and 2, 4. So you can see that I'm mapping to three different places. Because of this, we're going to call this a discrete function. We're going to talk about that in a minute again also. All right, so let's look at our second relation. Our second relation is looking at my domain. In my domain, I have negative 1, 1, and 4. In this range, I'm going to have a repeat value. Now when you repeat the value, you don't have to write it twice. So my range simply is going to be 3 and 5. Now when I do the mapping, uh, mapping my pairs, I see that negative 1 is going to map to 5, 1 maps to 3, but 4 also maps to 5. And that's okay, my x values can go to the same place, but my y values are not allowed to do that. All right, so what does that look like when I graph that? So that is negative 1, 5, comes up here, 1 maps to 3, and 4 also maps to 5. So it is a function but it is not both one to one and on two. This one would just be considered on two because we've used all of our range values, but one of our range values maps to two different domains. So this would be an on two function. And because I can count one, two, three, my points, it becomes a discrete function. The word discrete just means countable. So anytime I can count my values, that becomes a discrete function. All right, let's look at our last relationship here. I have 5, negative 3, 1, and negative 3 again. So I'm not going to write both negative 3s. And when I look at my range, my range are my y values. So my range is going to be 6, 0, and 1 with a 6 repeating. This time when I do my mapping, I see 5 maps to 6, negative 3 maps to 0, 1 maps to 1, but negative 3 also maps to 6. So here is one where I have an x value going to two different places. For that reason, it does not fall under the definition of a function because my x value can't output two different values. So this one would be considered 
not a function. All right, so let's let's graph this and see what not a function looks like. So again, I'm going to map 5, 6. I'm going to have to kind of sneak a point in above this value. Negative 3, 0, 1, 1, and negative 3, 6. I'm going to plot that up there too. Now notice what happens when I see not a function. You see how these y values stack on top of one another? What that does is that goes against a certain test that we have in algebra that's called the vertical line test. And what the vertical line test says is if you draw a vertical line anywhere on your graph and it hits more than one spot, that your relation is not a function. So this is not a function. So we're not going to label it one to one. We're not going to label it on two or both because it's not a function. So here's a conceptual idea of what that vertical line test is. And in words, it explains it again here. It says if no vertical line intersects a graph in more than one point, the graph represents a function. However, if a vertical line intersects a graph in two or more points, you can see these two points here, the graph does not represent a function. So this would be a function this is not a function. All right, so let's again analyze some different kinds of functions. Now I told you a, a few minutes ago that a discrete function would be categorized as countable values. So if I could go through and count how many values are on my graph, that's a discrete function. So if you see this one, two, three, four, five, six, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those are all countable. Also, they're all functions because if I go through and I draw a vertical line anywhere on those graphs, it only hits them once. All functions. So those are three examples of a discrete function. Another way to know that it's discrete is I have to keep picking up my pencil every time I go to another point. That makes it discrete. If I look at these continuous functions, these are three examples of continuous functions, you can see if I wanted to trace it, I never have to pick up my pencil. It continues through the whole graph, especially on the ends that you can't see the rest of the graph. That's what those arrows mean. So if I trace these graphs, I never have to pick up my pencil that means it is a continuous function. All right, so we talked about on to, one to one, discrete and continuous, and we talked about how to tell if it is a function. So let's look at a couple examples of not a function. So what does it look like when graphs are not a function? So here you see it mapped out for us. Every one of our x values are going to their own y values. What if, whether those y values repeat or not, that doesn't matter. For that reason, they are a function. When I look at this mapping, I see negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and 0 all goes to their own y's into a unique y. But this last value, 1, is shooting to two different places. For that reason, it's not a function. All right, now you see a couple examples here. Here is a function that would be continuous, however, it doesn't pass the vertical line test because it's hitting in more than one spot. For, so for that reason, it is not a function. And here's one more example, and it shows you one that is a function only hitting in one place and it shows you two more examples of where it hits more than once. As soon as it hits more than once, those are not a function. So you can see it by the mappings and you can see it by graphings, whether a relationship ends up being a function or not. Okay, so let's look at this graph and it says state the domain and range of the relation. So they don't have it written out as ordered pairs, they just have the points on the graph for us. It says then determine whether the relation is a function. 
if it is a function, determine if it is one to one, onto both or neither. So I'm going to take a quick glance and using that vertical line test, I'm going to um, just pretend that I'm drawing my vertical lines. And I can see that no matter where I graph it, that it is only hitting it in one place with my vertical line. So I know that it's a function. I also can count one, two, three, four, five values. So I also know that it is a discrete function. Now let's look at the domain and look at the range. So when I list my domain and range, what I do is I'm going to look at it least to greatest. So my domain are my x values. They go this way. So I am going to look left to right and, and list my points. My domain is negative 4, negative 3, so here's my domain, 0, 1, and 3. Those are the values in my domain. My range, I'm going to go bottom up because my range goes this way. My y values on my y axis. So I can see that I, they share a negative 2. Then my next y value is going to be 1, then 2, then 3. Now notice if I would do a quick mapping that negative 4 goes to 2, negative 2, and 0 goes to negative 2. That means that this is going to be an on to function because they're not all going to their own. So we have a function that is discrete and it is on to. All right, so just making sure we understand the language. All right, let's look at a second example. Now this does not give us a set of ordered pairs. This gives us an actual function. So they want us to graph y equals 3x minus 1. So from what we know, this is going to give us a line. I could see that my slope is 3 and my y-intercept is negative 1. So I'm going to plot that, my y-intercept at negative 1, and I'm going to count up 1, 2, 3 over 1. 1, 2, 3 over 1. Now, if I plotted points in there, it would make sense to put fraction values in there. So I could actually plot a one half. What is x when what is y when x is one half? So I could plug that value in and I would find a value on my graph that I could plot. So from there I can connect these to give me a linear graph. Alright, so obviously this is a function because I can look at this graph and I can see that it passes the vertical line test. I can also see because it creates a line that it is a continuous graph. Now if I map my domain and my range, what I could actually have, my domain on this function is going to be a little different than we're used to because we're used to putting those x values in, but I have an x value at all these places. So my domain, when I look left or right, I can see that it's going to be any value left to right from infinity to negative infinity. So that makes my domain be all real values. Now I make it fancy so that I can, um, I make a big fancy R, and what that fancy R means is that it means all real values for my x is my domain. My range on here, if I look down to up, you can see that once I continue this graph in both directions, I'm also going to hit every y value from negative infinity to infinity. So my range is also going to be that fancy R, or we interpret that as all real values. All right, now for this reason, when I look at the one-to-one -one and on-to, I notice that every x is going to have its own y and that none of the y values are repeating. So that means this is going to be categorized as both one-to-one -one and on-to.
All right, so we have a function. This function is continuous and it classifies as both one to one and on to. All right, now let's look at this problem here. It says the table shows the average fuel efficiency in miles per gallon for light trucks for several years. Graph this information and determine whether this function represents a function and is it discrete or continuous. So what I did here is we started with putting these years on the x-axis. So the year becomes my domain. That's my independent variable. The fuel efficiency are the values on my y-axis or they become my range of values. Notice that you don't see anything between 95 and 96 or between 96 and 97 or so forth. So what we're going to get when we graph this are just point values. So in the year 1995, the fuel efficiency was 20.5. In 96, it's 20.8. In 97, it's back down to 20.6. In 98, it rose all the way up to 20.9. But in 99 and 2000, it dropped to 20.5 for both of those years. And in 2001, it dropped down to 20.4. So you can see that if I drew a vertical line, I would get a function. But what I have is a discrete function. And if I classify it even more, seeing that I have the same two y values, that would mean that this is an onto function when those y values repeat and I don't have a unique y value for every x. Okay, so it wouldn't make sense to have 95 and a half, so it wouldn't make sense to connect that graph. That means that it is discrete. All right, now let's look at this example. It says a commuter train ticket costs $7.25. The cost of taking the train x times can be described by the function y equals 7.25x. Now this almost looks like the line that we drew earlier, but in the context of the problem, it's asking us for x times. Now you can't ride a train a half of a time or a full quarter of a time. So what we're going to plug in are just whole numbers. I can take the train one time. I can take the train two times. I can take the train three times. And if I do, then my y is going to cost me 725. If I take it twice, my y is going to be $14.50. So you can see that x being the time, y is outputting my money. If I take it three times, my y would be $21.75. So if you think of what that's going to look on, like on the graph, I'm going to have discrete values. Now they're going to look like they are linear, but it wouldn't make sense to connect those values because you can't ride a train one and a half times, and that would be the number that would fall between 1 and 2. So for this reason, this would also be a discrete function, but it would both be both on 2 and 1 to 1 because each x value has its own y value. So it would be both 1 to 1 and on 2. All right, the last part of this lesson I'm going to actually expound a little bit more in class tomorrow but I'm going to show you a different function notation. Now we talked briefly at the beginning about that y value turning into a function notation where we use f of x as its notation. What that allows us to do is work with multiple functions at the same time and not having to reuse y, y, y every time. But again, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in tomorrow's lesson. But for now, I just wanted to show you a couple examples. So when it asks us to find f of negative 2, what it's asking us to find is what is y when x is negative 2? So what I do here is in the function itself, every time I see an x in the function, 
I'm going to replace it or input a negative 2 into that function. And then I work through the math. So if I do negative 2 cubed, that gives me negative 8. And negative 8 minus 3 is negative 11. So f of negative 2 is equal to negative 11. Again, that's a fancy way to ask you what is y when x is negative 2. So the ordered pair to plot would be negative 2, 11 on, an, on a coordinate graph. All right, notice that when I put in a number, I got out a number. In my second example, it's asking us to put in a 2t. So when I put in a 2t, again, everywhere I see an x in that function, I'm going to replace it with the input 2t. What I get is the output, so 2t cubed gives me 8t cubed minus 3. Now notice that I cannot simplify that in any further, so that would be the value of my function. So when I plugged in a number, my output was a number. When I plugged in a, an expression or a variable, my output was an expression. All right. We are going to talk more about the function notation and how to use it tomorrow. I will post your assignment to Google Classroom. I hope you have a wonderful day.